It is extremely interesting here. Hindemith's Turkish Sojans, 1935 to 1937. Hello, I'm Robert James Stove, and I've lived here in Melbourne since 2001. If in 1935 you had asked most musically literate people in the English speaking world to identify Germany's best known living composers, they would have mentioned two figures born a generation apart. First, Richard Strauss, who in 1935 reached the age of 71, and second, Paul Hindemith, who in 1935 reached the age of 40. No one else, however distinguished, would have occurred to musically literate English-speaking people unless they had a specialist knowledge of modern composition. In 1935, the 66-year-old Hans Fitzner, while respected by his fellow professionals, retained only a limited following within the general public. The same is true of his Austrian contemporary, Franz Schmidt. Schoenberg had fled the country once Hitler gained the chancellorship. Two briefly popular purveyors of opera, Eugen Dalbert and Franz Schreker had died in 1932 and 1934, respectively. Few people had heard of Karl Orff until in 1937, he achieved his sensational success with Carmina Putana. As for Austrian rather than German composers, 1935 was the year of Alban Berg's death while in 1935, both Anton Webern and Alexander Zemlinsky remained largely unknown outside Central Europe itself. But to say that Strauss and Hindemith remained the most celebrated composers living in the Germany of 1935 is not to imply that either man enjoyed great honour there. Fashionable opinion at this stage, and for long afterwards, regarded Strauss as an exhausted volcano, None of his post-1914 operas, with the partial exception of Alla Bella, or his post-1914 orchestral works had yet caught the popular fancy. The choleric dismissal of Strauss by Ernest Newman as, quote, a composer of talent who once was a genius, unquote, epitomized the prevalent view, outside as well as within Germany. National Socialist rule remained in its early stages too fearful of world opinion to ostracize Strauss and Hindemith completely, and it appointed both composers to its official musical institution, the Reichsmusikkammer, known for short as the RMK. In fact, it bestowed on Strauss the RMK's purely ceremonial presidency but it regarded both composers much more as nuisances whom in the short term it needed to indulge than as potential true believers. Both composers, themselves Gentiles, had far stronger Jewish connections than the regime found agreeable. Strauss had a Jewish daughter-in-law, Alice Grab, while Hindemith had a part Jewish wife, Gertrude Rottenberg, daughter of conductor Ludwig Rottenberg. In 1935, Strauss forfeited the RMK presidency, having incautiously articulated his contempt for the Nazi hierarchs in a letter to his Jewish librettist Stefan Zweig, a letter which the Gestapo intercepted. Between Strauss and Hindemith, there arose no friendship, notwithstanding the older man's grudging respect for the younger. The two men first met at the 1923 music festival in Donauerschingen, a town in Germany's southwest. There, a self-consciously avant-garde string quartet written by Hindemith had impinged itself upon Strauss's reluctant consciousness. The outcome is best described in a quote from Hindemith's biographer Jeffrey Skelton. Strauss addressed the composer in his broad Bavarian dialect. Why do you compose atonal music? You have plenty of talent. Hindemith replied in his equally broad Frankfurt dialect. Herr Professor, you make your music and I'll make mine. By Hindemith's criteria, 
this represented mild impudence. To a friend back in 1917, Hindemith had railed against Strauss's Alpine Symphony. He said to this friend, better to hang oneself than ever to write music like that. Even after expelling Strauss, though, the Hitler state refrained from subjecting him to the explicit invective that un it unleashed against Hindemith. At first, Hindemith had fallen publicly silent, partly through fear of endangering Gertrude and her relatives, partly through a fundamental lack of interest in day-to-day -day politics, partly through an uneasy conscience about his own more obviously transgressive musical labours during the Weimar Republic. These included the controversial scene from his comic opera Neues von Tage, News of the Day, where he had shown his heroine luxuriating in her bathtub to the fury of Hitler and Goebbels. In private, Hindemith was decidedly more outspoken. One of his Jewish students at the Berlin Hochschule, Franz Reisenstein, who would eventually escape to England, assured Geoffrey Skelton that, quote, Hindemith did not make any secret of his anti-Nazi convictions. He was not afraid of being given away to the authorities, though he could have been a hundred times over, unquote. Reisenstein also mentioned in print an incident where Hindemith bawled out an anti-Jewish composition student in Reisenstein's presence. Word of Hindemith's private opinions could well have reached Nazi leaders' ears. In December 1934, Goebbels addressed a party rally in Berlin's Sportspalast, where he excoriated Hindemith without once mentioning Hindemith's name. Goebbels asserted, not just thieves, but atonal musicians arrive on the scene who, in order to attain a particular sensation or remain close to the spirit of the time, allow naked women to appear on the stage in obscene scenes in a bathtub, making a mockery of the female sex, and in general, surrounding themselves with the biting dissonances of musical bankruptcy. Even this onslaught failed to worry Hindemith over much at first. He still, after all, possessed his RMK membership, and Goebbels had stopped short of formally prohibiting the performance of his output at this stage. Almost incredibly, in a clear sign of how little the regime's left hand then knew about what its right hand was doing, the Luftwaffe, this was after Goebbels' 1934 vituperation, commissioned Hindemith to write an orchestral piece in its own honour. Rather naively, Hindemith informed his publisher, Willy Strecker, that, quote, I want to give them something really good, unquote. By this time, Hindemith had reluctantly sworn the oath of allegiance to the Führer on which his continued RNK membership, and therefore his ability to earn a musical livelihood on German soil, depended. Nevertheless, he found the general artistic climate in the Third Reich increasingly uncongenial. When Wilhelm Furtwängler published a spirited, internationally noted newspaper article defending Hindemith's newly finished opera Matisse del Mahler, the article had the unintended consequence of intensifying the regime's hostility to Hindemith's endeavours. As the late pianist and musicologist Hamish Milne elegantly observed about Hindemith. His music was not, until October 1936, specifically banned, but it took more courage or foolhardiness than most promoters could muster to present it. So when Hindemith received an utterly unexpected letter from Sevat Bey, a high official in Turkey's education department, inviting him to come to Ankara and set up there a new school for propagating Western music, he greeted the official's invitation with delight as well as astonishment. Still more impressive, Sevat Bey visited Berlin and pleaded his case to Hindemith in person. The composer told Willy Strecker in February 1935, I wouldn't want to stay there full time, 
but for a few months in the year, gladly. Like Shakespeare's Coriolanus, and for somewhat similar motives, Hindemith had decided that there is a world elsewhere. He continued to reject any notion of expatriating himself and Gertrude permanently, but spending a few months in the year away from Goebbels could only be a win-win situation for composer and propaganda minister alike. Ultimately, Hindemith ended up making no fewer than four long visits to Turkey between 1935 and 1937. A juxtaposition of archaeology in America, Hittite ruins beside the latest in material comfort, all of it in an impressive desert landscape. Thus was Gertrude's first impression of life in Ankara once the couple had arrived there in April 1935. Her husband had neither the leisure nor the inclination for sightseeing reportage. He was incapable of undertaking one job when undertaking a dozen jobs would do. Far from revealing a primarily colonialist demeanour towards a subject race, Hindemith behaved towards his Turkish hosts in the same crash-through-or-crash way that he behaved towards German, Austrian, Swiss, French or British colleagues. Less than two weeks into his role, he announced to Strecker as follows. It is extremely interesting here. I go around inspecting whatever music there is, make proposal after proposal, and if everything is done as I suggest and the will is there, I shall be able to flatter myself with having put Turkish music on its feet. Meanwhile, we spend our time eating mutton and yogurt, watching the innumerable stalks. More tactful souls than Hindemith, whether in Ankara or anywhere else, might well have experienced problems in differentiating Hindemith's so-called suggestions from parade ground orders. Yet, in his drastic interventionism, Hindemith merely supplied what Atatürk demanded in the music sector as elsewhere. Back in 1928, the London Times had reported Turkey's ruler singing the praises of Western music. Two years later, when interviewed by the German biographer Emil Ludwig, Atatürk sounded much more intransigent. Suddenly, he asked Ludwig, how long has it taken you to reach the current status of Western music? Before the interviewer could respond, the interviewee answered his own question. It has been some 100 years, we don't have time to wait this long. As early as 1927, Atatürk had announced to the German pianist Wilhelm Kempf, who had given a recital in Ankara, that, quote, there can be no revolution without music, unquote. In short, Hindemith's Turkish adventures simply marked the climax of a musical westernization program which had started more than a decade earlier. Already in 1924, the president had imposed upon his country a new Western-style national anthem. In 1934, he would commission an entire opera entitled Ersoy from a Turkish-born composer, Ahmet Adnan Saigun. Although Saigun had not yet reached his 28th birthday, he could already boast significant musical accomplishments including the rare privilege of study under Vincent Dandy's tuition at the Schola Cantorum in Paris. Unfortunately, Hindemith detested Saigon for reasons which are not clear. To the Ministry of Education, Hindemith viciously described Saigon as, quote, this man who has no merits as a composer or a teacher and should be sent away, unquote. He would not have been the first or the last music pedagogue to prefer colleagues whom he could browbeat over colleagues who had already up achieved outstanding things well before he himself came along. Hindemith is extremely unlikely to have been aware of, nor would his hosts have wanted to emphasize, the well-documented pleasure which successive Ottoman sultans had taken in promoting Western music. Moreover, 
Ataturk's missionary fervor sometimes expressed itself through alarming methods, none more alarming than the occasion when Hindemith found himself abruptly awoken at three o'clock one morning and bundled in a car to the presidential palace. There, the insomniac Ataturk demanded of him an impromptu concert on the presidential piano. To the composer's febrile energies during the Ankara residence, Gertrude attested in missives to Willi Strecker and to Willi's brother, Ludwig Strecker. The first days were difficult enough with resistance and revolt in the Ankara Conservatoire Orchestra. I typed one bloodthirsty edict after another. Luckily, the ministry, headed by the minister himself, backed Powell's orders and even summarily dismissed one of the main troublemakers. Now he has been re-engaged and all is peace. The orchestra is running along nicely now. Statutes have been worked out, pianos ordered. Various sections in two elaborate reports that Hindemith submitted to Ankara officials must have irritated their recipients. His recommendation that a library be established devoted specifically to Turkish folk music cannot have endeared itself to Ataturk, who in 1934 had outlawed all broadcasting of such music by Turkish radio. Admittedly, Hindemith differed from Bartok, who also visited Turkey during this period, in that Bartok favoured specialising in gramophone records which contained such music, whereas Hindemith had yet to be convinced that easily damaged shellac discs could withstand the Turkish climate. That said, in their belief that studying folklore would artistically benefit all musicians, Hindemith and Bartok thought as one. When Hindemith maintained in his initial report from 1936 that young Turkish composers, quote, should be sent to the provinces to listen to the music of their own people, unquote, it could easily have been Bartok writing. For Hindemith, as for Bartok, when Hungary's government grew ever closer to the Third Reich, 1938 proved the year in which all compromises with Hitler's ambitions were perforce abandoned. Dusseldorf's May 1938 showcase of so-called degenerate music, or to use the original German, Entartete Musik, had Hindemith among its chief exhibits. In case Hindemith entertained any further uncertainty as to what the National Socialist bosses now thought of him, the showcase's display of him, put alongside that of Schoenberg, as if the two men were somehow stylistic confederates, was described in a singularly menacing slogan. Quote, he who eats with Jews dies of it, unquote. Husband and wife moved first to Switzerland, where the composer refused to accept local well-wishers offer of a monetary loan to compensate for the cost of their planned American voyage. He asked the would-be benefactors, and if I couldn't find any work over there, who'd we pay you? As is now well known, Hindemith did indeed find work over there, above all at Yale, where he obtained a professorship. But early in the war, his fears of unemployment were understandable. In conclusion, what did Hindemith make of his Turkish experiences? A curious sentence in Skelton's biography leaps out from its context, which deals with the composition of Hindemith's symphonic dances. Skelton tells us the following. He, Hindemith, also wrote a detailed sketch including passages of dialogue of an opera on a Turkish subject, but this was never completed. We have abundant cause to regret that nothing came of Hindemith's planned opera on a Turkish subject. Regret is sharpened by remembrance of the composer's more obviously misguided post-1945 preoccupations. Among these preoccupations must be numbered first his unshakable belief that his grand opera Die Harmonie der Welt 
over which he havered inconclusively for two decades, would forever establish itself in the international repertoire. Second, his time-consuming overhaul, completed in 1952, of the 1926 score for another opera, Cardiac. Those who have seen on stage both the 1926 and the 1952 versions of Cardiac are adamant that the 1926 version is superior and that the 1952 version warrants Sam Goldwyn's paradoxical but immediately intelligible epigram. You've improved it worse. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much.